Good afternoon. There are so many things I'd like to tell you, but first I have to take a poll of the audience. How many members of the wardroom are present? Former members of the wardroom? Oh, that's good. That means without any officers, I can speak freely. <laughs> and chiefs are wont to do that upon occasion. Um, I am indeed a chief petty officer of the United States Navy Reserve. Um, I was in Afghanistan during the surge. Um, I came to the Navy very late, and so I'm, here I am facing you a very august audience because I'm certain there are a great many naval historians here. Whether you've written books or whether you just read voraciously, you probably know more naval history than I do. And that is uh, heritage and naval history are something that the chief petty officers are charged with guarding and passing down uh, to our junior sailors, as you all know. So I've always loved history. I've been a military historian in one fashion or another for almost 40 years. I know, it doesn't seem possible when you look at me to think that, how, what, did he start when he was two? <laughs> I actually just turned 50, and the reason that that's significant is I joined the Navy at 38, right after 9-11. Uh, my dad was Korea, uh, U.S. Army. My uncle was Korea, United States Navy, an unrated seaman uh, attached to the Quartermaster's Division aboard the USS Wasp. So I had these, you know, this kind of proud heritage of uncles and, and a father who served in the military uh, during the time of war. And I grew up, as all of you did, with those heroes in film and story. And on that day, 9-11, my daughter, who is not here, was sitting on my lap. She was two and a half years old, and I said, oh, this is, this is big. This is Pearl Harbor. And how am I going to answer her and say I did nothing? And I, I really did. I mean, it, it sounds corny, but I didn't want to tell my daughter I did nothing. And I knew that question would come up sometime in the future. So I started calling recruiters. And the only one that, that really answered the phone and wanted to have anything to do with me was a Navy Reserve recruiter, who then didn't show up for the appointment because she thought I wouldn't show up. They had been so flooded and inundated with guys that wanted to get back in the Navy, who were in their 40s, guys that said, like me, who said, you know, I didn't do it when I was younger and I've got to do it now. So I showed up and lo and behold, you know, long story short, I had to write an age waiver uh, down to NOLA and say, please take me, I know I'm old, but I, ha I want to serve my country. And they said, okay, we, we'll let you do that. So I was a journalist. This MC business is, you old salts probably remember journalists and photographers mates and, draftsmen and lithographers, and they decided to bunch us all together and, and make us mass communications, which I think is just mass confusion. But uh, I became a chief petty officer in 2008. I, my anchors were pinned down by my family in front of all and sundry in the mess. And I deployed to Afghanistan during the surge with NMCB-18. Do we have any CBs present? All right, I was with a construction battalion out of the Pacific Northwest, the Skookum Mamuk which translates to the Mighty Builders. And they indeed were Mighty Builders. As a reserve battalion, they averaged 30, 32 years old, 560 some of them, plus or minus. And they did tremendous things, things that CBs haven't done since the Second World War. And I was very proud to be a part of that battalion. And, and I served as the X-5 public affairs officer from uh, July of 2010 until March of 2011. So. Great experience. I love the Navy. We'll see how much longer the old bod will hold up and you know, let me keep doing the PFA. Um, physical fitness exam, as you all are probably familiar with. So I had started writing Indians, Rogues, and Giants um, in 1999, and it was a lark. Uh, I wasn't in the Navy. I was a military bu history buff, uh, had done some lecturing done some teaching, I have a bachelor's degree in anthropology, I have graduate work in American history, and about 30 years as a living historian, which translates to reenactor. The guys that dress up on the weekend and go out and play war. I like to think of myself as a living museum. My kids do too. So, uh, I, and I've lectured on all of those, you know, in all of those eras, and, and it's not something where I talk about hardtack. I'm not that, there, there are different levels of interest in American history. Some people, you know, they, they want to know how you made the hardtack, and how did you clean your musket, and all that stuff, and I could do all that, but that's kind of boring. I don't think it's very germane. I was always kind of a big picture American history person, um, and I find that American history is, 
you're all avid readers, American history is often mistreated. We tend to uh, break it down into events, decades. When we teach it in our school system, you know, we want to talk about the revolution and the French and Indian War as though they were separate events, very isolated from each other, you know, and then we've got War of 1812, and we've got Industrial Revolution and Civil War. We just break it all down like that, which of course has no bearing on, on reality because people don't live in a period or in a war. You know, their lives span many events. And so that's always been my take on American history. And I, the other thing I like to look at are the, the people. I mean, we talk about battles and we talk about, you know, uh, victories and losses and great inventions, but the human factor, as anybody who's been in the Navy will agree, the human factor is what drives it. You know, without our sailors, we just have great big steel ships that do nothing. You gotta man them. And historic events, that's, that's what drives them, are the people that, that create them, the people that you know, do those awesome, amazing things day in and day out that have done them for hundreds and thousands of years. And so when I write, I kind of want to delve into that. And I probably overdo it. I don't think I overdo it as a writer. I overdo it in the, in the process. I just kind of, you know, I can't let go. And I'm like, kind of like, I get a bone in my teeth and I just gnaw on it. Drives my kids nuts. We, we just came down from Maine and everywhere you go in New England, there's something historic. There's a brown sign for this, and there's a brown sign for that, and you know, you're, it's a shipyard, it's a fort, you know, there's something. And, uh, and I try to connect those dots for my kids. And that's what I try to do as an author, it's what I try to do as a chief when I'm working with sailors, sharing heritage with them. You, it, fiction is so different. Now, I, I listened to some of the other books that, uh, that John introduced, you know, that are going to be future lecturers. Those people are so much smarter than I am. I am not, I, I'm not capable of focusing enough thought and energy to bring something new to the table. <laughs> I want to reach out there and grab from all those different events and people and pull it together into a story. And I do think that there is a place even for really sharp texts like yourself to read fiction. I think we need our brains to relax sometimes. We also need to, to feed it a little with some imagination. That is what drives invention. That is what dri uh, drives you know, new thought. Um, and if any of you have worked in, in the intelligence field, you probably have read some fiction. Uh, our intelligence <laughs> world relies heavily on the free thought of imaginative people. And it's imaginative people that bring so much to it. Ian Fleming was himself a, uh, you know, an intelligence operative. And, and later, uh, you know, at management level. And look what he wrote. So I write fiction, and I, and I go out there and I glom on to all these facts, and I try to pull them together in a way that's entertaining. Something that you haven't read before, perhaps a new perspective. Now, that said, Indians, Rogues, and Giants is as John gave you the little blurb, you know, one man's journey. I don't think I need to revisit um, a lot of previous works. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so I tried to create characters that perhaps you hadn't encountered. And my principal character is one of those guys who just kind of goes through life and good things happen to him, despite the fact that he's a first class heel. Um, life is very unexpected, at least that's been over my 50 years, that's been my takeaway. You think you understand it, you think you know where it's going, you think you know what's going to happen next, because you planned it that way. And then something comes along and sidelines you, or perhaps you benefit from, you know, an unforeseen windfall. And so that's what happens with my characters a great deal. And so I invented a, a young subaltern which was the, the phrase back in the day, 200 years ago, for a junior officer in the British and even in the, uh, the Continental Army during the Revolution. Subalterns were ensigns and junior lieutenants. And so I created a subaltern who's kind of a ne'er-do-well, comes from a, a rough background. But back then, unlike today, you could buy a commission. 
I suppose the, somebody could argue in the future that, well, that's what they did when they sent them to West Point and what they did when they sent them to the Naval Academy because there's a tab associated with that. But we're so much more democratic today in that we go out and we, you know, we cherry pick those bright young minds, those bright young men and women, and we encourage them to come to our academies and you can't just buy your way in. But back then, literally, here's some money and you give me a commission. That did change. There were uh, some reforms in the British military establishment in the 18th century. They did away with that system because they realized that it wasn't really the best way. You tended to get a lot of inbred nobility that couldn't think their way out of a, a paper bag and really weren't the guys you wanted leading your troops on a battlefield. But until the, the Duke of Cumberland's reforms took effect, you could buy a commission. So this young man, his parents buy him a commission because they're trying to you know, make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And so he comes to the colonies and starts to suffer a series of, as John said, misadventures. And today, you know, we would, we would think of these things as maybe a little bit fantastical. But if you read it, I think, you know, it, it'll work for you. Because everybody that's reviewed it so far says it works for them. And it, the inspiration that I had as I was writing was uh, an officer named Major Robert Stobo, who during the French and Indian War was attached uh, as a subaltern to the 60th of Foot, which was the one colonial American regiment on the Royal Military Establishment. And Major Stobo was with Colonel Washington when Colonel Washington uh, signed a capitulation to the French at Fort Necessity, which brought about the French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War, it was he literally threw a hand grenade in, into the room, pulled the pin and threw it in. Because what Washington did is he said, yes, I assassinated Lieutenant Jumonville, who was a French officer. He admitted to setting an ambush, springing the ambush, killing the French officer in disputably French territory. And Young Colonel Washington really wasn't um, as well schooled. He needed the Naval War College to tell him how to handle command, but he didn't have it, and he signed the capitulation. The French said, hey, good, terrific. Now, you can march off back to Virginia, take your drums, take your guns, keep your flags, just case them up. So away he went, but he had to offer up some officers uh, on good faith that he would return to Virginia, and one of those was uh, I guess he was a major by this, by this point, Major Robert Stobo. So Major Stobo went by kind of a circuitous route from Fort Necessity, which is in the wilds of Pennsylvania, to Fort Niagara, from Fort Niagara to Montreal. And along the way, he makes sketches of the layout of Fort Niagara, sticks it in his boot, they don't catch him. He makes good friends with the French officers, and they think he's just a jolly good fellow. So they give him his parole, which is to say the freedom of the town in Montreal. In other words, hey, you promise you're not going to go anywhere. You promise you're not going to try to escape. You know, you can, you can walk about. So he does. He breaks his parole, tries to escape, and they, and they take him, you know, and they give him a, you know, thou shalt not kind of a conversation. They lock him up for a little while, tell him he's a bad boy. He's a very clever chap. He take, charms them again, and they give him his parole. Well. This time he succeeds. And he manages to escape down the St. Lawrence. He encounters a native family, probably Huron or Abenaki. And in the 18th century, his feats would have been considered heroic. Today, we might look a little askance. He murders said Native American family, steals all of their furs, which they were paddling up to Montreal to trade, and begins paddling their canoe down the St. Lawrence. He encounters a schooner. He manages somehow to load the fur onto the schooner and steal the schooner and sail it back to Boston. All of this happened to one man who truly existed. So, as you begin to encounter the adventures of St. Crispin Mullen, I hope you will, because much of the proceeds from the sale of today's books will benefit the museum. Um, keep in mind Major Stobo because he was sort of the genesis for this project, which, as I started to tell you, began as a short story that was meant to be a lark. And I had dabbled with a couple of novels 
when I was much younger, and that completed them, and this one got away from me. So I really enjoyed it, and it just didn't stop, and it grew, and it grew over about six years until I completed it um, and started seeking publishing when I came back um, from Afghanistan. But the, the tie-in for all of you is that it's a military officer. Um, it will give you a flavor for military life in the 18th century. I also dabble a little bit with, with privateering. And privateering and piracy, as you probably are all aware, and I'm sure we have a very astute audience here, are um, pretty close. The only difference between a privateer and a pirate is one document. And many a privateer, when told to cease and desist, decided that ceasing and desisting was not what he wanted to do. And even though his letters of mark, he didn't have letters of mark from a governor, from a, uh, um, a regent, allowing him to prey upon the commerce of another nation, continued to prey upon the commerce, and sometimes upon the commerce of his own nation. Not, I think that modern contemporary fiction, and by that I mean you know, fiction of the last 150 years, kind of um, glorifies and certainly um, takes a lot of license with that. There were privateers that did that. The majority of privateers returned to more peaceful occupations at the end of war and when their letters were no longer good. The letter of Mark kind of, you know, uh, taking advantage and, and going on and pirating is more of a 17th century um, type of event. I mean, it just didn't happen a lot in the 18th century. In the first half of the 18th century, um, colonial Britain and the United Kingdom are coalescing. Um, you have the end of the Jacobite Rebellion, you know, which eventually pulls together the entire kingdom to be the United Kingdom as we know it today. They began policing both the seas and the land much more strictly. It, and they had a, a, a plan of expanding infrastructure within England and law and order really took you know, a strong hold in the 18th century. And that's probably, you know, from my my study and research, I would have to say that the, the modern world as we know it truly begins to emerge just before the French and Indian War. There was a lot of freebooting, even in government, um, things that we would hopefully not tolerate today. Uh, in England, uh, you know, the, the granting of sinecures and elevating people to high office based on birth, based on bribery, just all kinds of nasty behaviors going on prior to that. But as we move into the mid 18th century, you really see a new moral behavior in government. And you see government take on an expanded role in the lives of people in England and in the colonies. And that really was um, probably one of the motive forces in ending piracy and uh, creating a, an environment where it wasn't easy for privateers to cross that line. The Royal Navy and their squadrons that patrolled um, all the colonies, but especially in the Caribbean and along the Atlantic coast, um, became very powerful and a, and a force to be reckoned with. And people took it very seriously. I mean, you know, we can harken back to the, you know, the story of Edward Teach, you know, and, and how he was taken. Um, and that while it's uh, romanticized, it probably is, is, is a, a cusp moment for the Royal Navy in the 18th century and for colonials to go, oh, they're, they're not kidding. They're really serious about this. Uh, Maynard, Lieutenant Maynard, you know, took Teach, reportedly took his head off, you know, and he's hung at the dock. Um, and we see smuggling uh, reduced, not done away with, but reduced. You know, we still don't have a cutter service. In the colonies, uh, smugglers are still sneaking in and out of the eastern seaboard, but the Royal Navy squadrons are, you know, starting to put a, a lid on that too. And of course, that's that comes to the revolution and and you know much of the ill will that colonial Americans were directing back home to government in England because it was starting that strong um, hold that the Royal Navy had that long arm. Um, was starting to affect the economy here at home. So as I, I started to tell you, the main character in getting, simply getting to the colonies, encounters a privateer. So there's, you know, like 40 pages, he's involved with a privateer. 
won't tell you, won't spoil for you how he gets involved with a privateer. But as you can see, privateering was critical in the 18th century. The cost of a ship of the line would have been the same equivalent as for us building an aircraft carrier today. So it, and they didn't have great revenue collecting. And there was so much um, malfeasance in government with people skimming money that government often found itself uh, short of the funds it needed. Oh, gee, it's not that different than today. But <laughs> they did find themselves shorthanded. And when you needed to quickly ramp up, um, privateers were a very uh, um, uh, simple expedient to doing that. Because all you had to do was rip off letters authorizing. You didn't have to give them guns. You didn't have to give them crews. They took care of all of it. Now, why governments didn't take a piece of the action is unknown. But none of the major governments of the 18th century got in on the action of privateers. There, was, there were some fees associated with condemning a ship, but they didn't, like, King George didn't say, and you owe me 20% of the value of every ship condemned. Didn't happen. But be that as it may, they utilized privateers in the French and Indian War to capture almost 1,300 merchant vessels. Now, I don't know. You know, very poor records were kept. There were undoubtedly more ships than that that were not reported. We don't have, you know, really careful um, details regarding uh, cargoes, sizes of vessels. So we don't know the, you know, the details of the depth of the impact that this had on economies but it was important. And so, you know, when you think of the 18th century and privateering, you know, it's not just these haphazard pirate types. Uh, these were, and oftentimes, by show of hands, anybody here know of a fellow named Patrick O'Brien? I'm a huge fan myself, so, you know, Aubrey finds himself on, half, on shore at half pay and ends up taking the surprise out and using her as a privateer and is issued a letter of mark. Now, is some of that romantic? Yes. But mostly it's true. Half pay officers did find themselves, you know, in need of employment. So we can also look at, you know, the privateer not only as a reserve force, but you know, depending on what lens you put him under, He's also potentially a mercenary. He could be listed, depending on who's looking at him, as a mercenary. And we've seen that in you know, the last 40 years. Um, Rhodesia was overrun with mercenaries in the 1970s. So, um, and there are, I, I will dare say, and as a, a current member of the military, I know that in 150 years, they're gonna look at Blackwater, they're gonna look at security agencies that we're using, that we're contracting with, they're going to be viewed that way also. The Romans did it. They augmented the legions with German mercenaries. So this is a, an expedient that's been used throughout history. Undoubtedly will continue to be. But when you look at privateers, when you read about privateers, you know, maybe put, put that lens over the top of them and view them that way. Um, I, I wanted to weave a fun story. I wanted to weave a story that was sort of treasure island for grown-ups. You know, we all read it as kids, and I've, I've read it to my children, you know. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson is an amazing author, I, I, and I'm a fan of Robert Louis Stevenson, um, James Fenimore Cooper, um, but they're, they're tough to wade through sometimes. Some books are better, and some are a little harder, and I wanted something that was a little grittier. So Indians, Rogues, and Giants is sort of, you know, influenced by those authors, and as I said, influenced by Major Stobo, the, the, the individual in the 60th of foot. And you, know, you, you can't tell the story of colonial America without you know, touching on maritime subjects because it was crucial to everything that we did. A uh, fact that's not, a factoid that's not in there. Um, during the French and Indian War, over 36,000 Americans served on a privateer. 
Now, we're talking a population by the time of the revolution of two million. At the time of the French and Indian War, colonial Britain, uh, colonial British North America, would have had a population less than two million, because there was actually a big influx in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, all right? So post the French and Indian War, they were still coming. So something under two million, 36,000 of those available men served at one time or another aboard a privateer. That was the Powerball of the day. If you, if, if that, you need that explained, it was simply, you know, cash was very hard to come by. We were not an economy that was based on hard currency. And of course, hard currency then literally meant silver and gold, copper. Notes were starting to be issued, but it, hard currency was indeed hard. Um, so, you know, it, without that hard currency to buy the many things that they needed, people found other ways, and that included smuggling and privateering. So, St. Crispin Mall encounters a privateer, and I hope you'll enjoy the privateer that he encounters. Uh, every one of our cities at that time was a port. We didn't have any great inland cities. Philadelphia would have been the closest. Still has access to the sea. You know, Boston and Charleston and New York are the three biggies. Uh, and obviously today, Charleston is not. Uh, Charleston did not, you know, uh, grow the way that New York and Boston did. But Don't at that Newport. And Newport. Well, and Newport. And Providence. Well, and Providence plays a role here in this story. I didn't use Newport, but I did use Providence. Um, because New England is indeed, um, you know, it's, it's the point of, of all great mercantile traffic in the colonies between New York and Boston. Charleston uh, plays a role, but it's more for getting tobacco out and bringing in uh, hard goods, what they called fancy goods, for the, peop the, the very small population of South Carolina was a more of a strategic port than it was uh, a, a great mercantile uh, portal. So New York, Boston, Providence, Hartford. But in, in for the sake of Indians, Rogues, and Giants, Providence plays a role. Um, couldn't get him everywhere. <laughs> the journey starts in Charleston comes north. I'm not, I'm not going to delve into every detail of it because that would just spoil it and it's pointless. Um, it's also, I also use it as a way to expose people maybe to some ideas about colonial America that, you, that popular histories don't touch on. And I think there's a tendency today to do, to kind of re-engineer American history and that goes a little too far too sometimes. Uh, Parson Weems wrote the first really huge popular 18th or early 19th century history of America, which then propagated a whole bunch of myths. You know, and that sort of lasted through the 19th century. When we get into the 20th century, we decide we really need to reinvent, and then some of the reinvention, I think we've lost touch with some things, try to find some balance. But certainly, uh, you know, early histories of the United States and the colonies the French and Indian War, you know, pre-colonial, or uh, 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 anyhow, French and Indian, tend to focus on, you know, white men of European descent. We were it, or so we would like to think, but we weren't really, you know, I mean, there were, the, 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 uh, the color of America was so much richer than that. Um, so the story also has some of that. Um, we also like to think that people had very strict mores. Well, they didn't. That's more antebellum. 18th century, people were dirty. They were nasty. Um, and they were uh, quite a bit more immoral than they would be later on, post the War of 1812. You know, uh, they were naughty. You know, women showed a little bit more cleavage in the 18th century. Uh, men tended to, you know, it was usually called dalliance. You know, he played the field. So, you know, the, the morals were very different. People didn't think twice about taking or giving bribes. 
So I try to weave a lot of that in and a lot of that thought and not to judge them through a 21st century uh, sensibility. You know, they were who they were based upon the times they lived in and I don't think they need us apologizing for them. Just as I don't think the 19th century needs us to apologize for them. They were who they were based upon the times that they lived in and we need to, to look at them as multidimensional people. 